maybe if you could all go on mute at this point, maybe if that's all right. Well, good afternoon. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here um, and with such great company, um, I'm really delighted to be chairing this session on portraying future hope in the arts. It couldn't be a more appropriate subject for us to be, discuss to, to be discussing today. Um, my hope is that it's going to be a very open discussion. Um, we have some, um, I, I'm very clear that there's going to be a lot of things that, uh, are, 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 that are really going to be uh, relevant for our, for our conversation uh, amongst the practices of the artists here. What we're going to do is each of the uh, each of the panelists will speak very briefly for let's say three minutes, maybe talk about their practice and their and what and what they do and how it might um, move us towards a conversation that we can open up. We've only got forty five minutes. We're going to talk uh, individually. We're going to talk together. We're going to hopefully open it up for some uh, conversations. Um, I'm joined today by. Um, uh, Annabel Dow, Ellen Eagle, Lucy Glendonning, and as if by magic, Elliot Reichert just just arrived. Um, and so, welcome, Elliot, uh, and Katja Strums. Um, and I'll talk, I'll just I'll present, uh, I'll just give you a little idea of their um, of, 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 of what they do, and I'll do it in alphabetical order, although I'm not sure that that's necessarily the uh, um, the fairest way to do things. Um, Annabel Dow's work um, takes place at the intersection of writing and speech and non-verbal modes of communication. Her paper-based constructions, audio-video works and performances explore the expressive possibilities of ordinary language and reveal intimacies between individual and collective experience. Much of her recent work focuses on participatory sound projects. And in 2018, she produced um, Hucheida. Uh, uh, I should have got that pronounced, pronounced right. Is that, is that right, Annabelle? Yeah. Uh, Hucheida. Hucheida. Shoo, 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 Okay, okay. <laughs> we'll do uh, Transcription. Um, an audio work for for um, uh, the National Museum in Beirut uh, that includes the voices of people of Beirut. Um, another participatory sound, the work, What Do You Forgive Yourself For, is currently on view at DG Kunstram in Munich as part of the exhibition In Search Of. Uh, Dow was born and raised in Beirut and lives in New York. Uh, Ellen Eagle, uh, her paintings in pastel focus on the human form and spirit. Working from life in her natural light studio, each painting develops over a period of 50, 60 hours. Her work is exhibited widely and her portrait of Maxine Hong Kingston is in the collection of the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery in Washington. Lucy Gendenning is an artist uh, based in the UK, working predominantly in sculpture and installation but also using poetry, photography, drawing, and film. And she works predominantly with the figure as a tool to investigate philosophical questions, medical information, and psychological studies. Uh, she often works collaboratory, collaboratively across disciplines, being awarded a Kulbenkian Award for a Quantum Potential Project, and also receiving two Landscape Institute Awards, a Civic Trust Award and a Red Rose Award for large-scale projects. She's exhibited widely in Europe, USA, and Asia, and has regularly exhibited in art fairs, biennials, and museums. Elliot, Elliot Reichert, Elliot Josephine Leila Reichert um, is a curator, critic, and editor. And she's been involved um, in a huge number of exhibitions uh, over the years, but she is also the inaugural curator of contemporary art at the Ashkenazi Museum in India, at, at Indiana University. Uh, Elliot was formerly the curatorial fellow at the Chicago Artists Coalition, art editor of New City, and assistant curator at the Block Museum of Art at Northwestern University. 
Katja Strunz has exhibited widely uh, with dozens of solo exhibitions since 1997. Uh, she studied philosophy before art. And uh, if I might quote her um, as a description of, of, of her work, she says, my work revolves around the intertwining of time, space and movement. Memory and trauma play a central role, as does the idea of pausing to perceive oneself physically and psychologically. The unfolding material stands metaphorically for the unfolding and expansion of space. I think one of the things that really strikes me about um, the conversation that I hope we might be able to have today is um, just how all of these, all of all, all, everyone in this conversation really has embedded as part of their practice some of the elements that the title of this session provokes. It occurs to me that we think of our discussions uh, we think of art in um, as a means of analysing and understanding the moment in which we find ourselves, the present tense. Um, but it seems that we really only come to understand that art, perhaps in retrospect, that we look back and go, ah, it, it understood where we were then. In the here and now, art is potentially very problem, very hard to read, very hard to know where the priority might take time. Art has a duty, I would argue, to be in the present, and um, our understanding and purpose of it, nevertheless, might only be understood belatedly. I would say that art takes time. So how might we speak of an art of the future, or indeed, how could art portray the future in, uh, as, the, uh, as the title of our session suggests? Perhaps now, more than ever, it's the very opportunity for speculation to think through what art might be and what it might do. And I think at this particular moment in history where we've been speaking in terms of the past couple of years of a reset, and a rethink in the way that we've been living, in the ways that we've been living our lives. We, as we emerge from two of the most extraordinary years that any of us probably will be able to remember, we might want art to be a, a resource and a site for thinking through what the conditions of our future might be. So that's just, that's just a provocation. But I wonder if we might just, in order to situate this conversation, maybe we'll just, each of you might want to talk a little bit about your work and how, uh, how we go from there. And, and well, forgive me, shuhada is something I say very often. So um, the transcription um, on, on, on my piece of paper here, um, is uh, um, yeah, stumped me, but um, could you could could you talk a little bit about your project? Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, uh, I was actually I, I hadn't intended to show this, but since we're talking about possibility and the future, um, this is a new work of mine called Another Country. Um, and I'll share my screen just quickly. Um, let me see it. Um, so this is a it, this is a microfiber piece where I I cut out. Um, it's difficult to see all the words, but there are about five hundred words here, and it's uh, another facet, another possibility, another future, um, anything you can think of, and. Part of um, you know uh, my my aim with my work is to in some way carve out or hold or uh, um, exhibit in some sense the language of our daily lives and our common and shared language. I'm really interested in the language that you that, that we use um, 
repetitively that we all use language that's not that is not actually um, trying to say too much, but it's just the language that actually exists. And when you were talking about what um, what what um, about the future, in some sense, I feel like my work is about trying to kind of pull a moment of sound right now. You know. So um, a couple of projects, the Shuhaida project is a project where I went to, I went back to Beirut, um, I grew up there during the war, and, um, and I brought people in off the street, literally, you know, asked them to come in and brought them from all parts of the city, and we walked through the museum in a kind of performative way, and I asked them to take on the voice of, of the objects in the museum or talk about them from a contemporary perspective. And so, in a sense, we were actually putting a layer of contemporary contemporaneity onto the, onto the pieces. Another project that, I, that I've done is, um, it's a long-running project called Fortune, where I, I'm sorry, um, where I, um, uh, I take on the role of a fortune teller and for $10 in all kinds of contexts, including museums, you put out your hands and I write a line of text for a line in your hand. And, and then I give you the paper. So you bought a work of art by me, made for you, about you, and about some idea of what the future can hold. Um, so I, I want to end now because I know there's a lot of time, but I basically my interest and my interest in this is who has a voice in the institution? Who has a voice? Who has a, whose voices remain, actually? If, in the structure of, um, of art, because it seems to me more and more that even though uh, we're talking about how art is representative of a much broader community and we're shifting the narrative and the archive, it feels to me that it's more and more isolated from the real experience of us. And by us, I mean artists and people who, who are not in, in a position of power. Thank you, Annabelle. Um, Ellen, would you like to um, present something? Andrew, you're muted. Okay. Um, well, I am a figure and portrait painter. And um, when I was a little girl, my father had a store in a working class immigrant neighborhood. And many of the people in the community did not speak English. These were immigrants. And we had people from many countries and they would come into the store and I had to be in the store after school and on Saturdays. And I was fascinated by these people whose language I did not understand. And I spent hours and hours trying to find clues about who these people were from their clothing, from their skin textures, from their coloring, from their fingernails, if they were dirty or clean, and what items they were buying. And I have spent my entire life as an artist doing that. I look for clues in people's posture, in their facial expressions that change with such subtlety moment to moment. I work pretty much in silence, so I do speak with my sitters during breaks and I slowly build narratives about them. And to me, this is the crux of building empathy, honoring people's individual experiences, loving them for it, I always feel that I'm, I'm experiencing love for the people who are sitting for me. They get up every day. They have their struggles. They have their, their losses. They find their wins. And 
they have such courage and at the same time they're so vulnerable and so i i have a very one on one kind of a life um i don't have grandiose goals my goals are very individual one on one with people and that is so valuable and sustaining for me and i always think about what experiences brought this person to my studio today what is their background and how will they be tomorrow and that's it Sorry, I'm just working my technology. Thank you, Ellen. That's really that that that's great. Um, if we can go straight on to Lucy. Hi, hi. Uh, great to you. Um, my kind of practice is um, I'm more kind of at the moment working with. Uh, I do quite a bit of kind of research. It often doesn't really go anywhere, but it kind of informs what I'm doing and I kind of looking at the kind of series of uh where I see people are kind of self-reporting with a group of people they're self-reporting about the kind of their physicality of a mental state and it's kind of come down from kind of lockdown and how in isolation we kind of had quite a different feel and I um I've got some images but I think by the time I get them up I'm not going <laughs> to get through them but a um so with these projects, I'm kind of looking to find out, it's like the ghost in the machine, the kind of combination of how we think we feel and how we look and how we feel we look affects how we look we feel and all the kind of combination of those thoughts. And But I wanna, my reaction really to the question that was posed was that it made me think of uh, art as a way of thinking and not as a way of people, the way they think. and. And, and in a way, look, so I've been to so many exhibitions where they ha where it's kind of been totally unexpected. It's, it's I've been thinking it's about a certain subject and I had a idea about it or thought about it. And when I've gone to the ex exhibition, it's made me think about it in a completely different way and in a way that I would never otherwise have thought of. And I think in, you know, with the, with the kind of question, how can artists help? And, and I would say, uh, really, it's, it's about being allowed to have a say, it's being allowed to kind of be asked the question. And it might not be that artists um, have the answers, but I think it might be a way that they, they kind of have the idea of being able to ask a question uh, in a way that, and, and frame the place we are and, and look at kind of possible futures and possible future outcomes in, in light of historical facts that, that I think would be really, I don't think any other group of people have such a wide ranging ability to do this. And if we think about what happens when you look at an artwork, we know for a fact that it gives people uh, empathy and critical thinking and it helps with kind of imagination. All those things I think are kind of underestimated of kind of ways of thinking. And, I, and, and in a way, rather than kind of, I could talk for hours about my practice, but I just wanted to kind of point pinpoint that because I feel quite passionately that art's quite often the outsider and, the, and a revolutionary, but in fact has enormous amount to bring to the table. So I won't, I don't want to go go on to them, so I know we haven't got long. So, <laughs> so that's what I wanted to kind of say. That's great, thank you, Lucy. Elliot, over to you. Um, cool. Great. Thanks so much. This is really exciting already. Actually, there's a lot here that I want to ask questions about. And um, so I'm located in southern Indiana at a museum that strives to be encyclopedic and strives to be um, a resource for uh, scholars, for students, um, both specialists and generalists. And um, I'm very lucky to have this object in our collection um, which is the 1965 reproduction of Marcel Duchamp's Fountain. And um, I, I bring it up because it's an object lesson that I 
um, I use with students these days. Um, one, of course, in the kind of classic thinking about, you know, what art is. And, and um, I was really glad that our prompt started with thinking about art not being understood in its own time and perhaps not being understood anymore. And I think this work, in some ways, every time I approach it, um, you know, appears just as strange as it probably did in 1917 or 1964 when it was reproduced. Um, I was thinking about this this date, 1917, a lot. Um, you know, this is the date of the Bolshevik Revolution, the end of World War II, uh, the, the Balfour Declaration, which established Zionism in, um, in the Middle East. Um, the first Pulitzer Prize was awarded in 1917, and um, the NAACP was marching in Washington, protesting lynching. Uh, sorry, in, in New York. And um, so I, I, I just, I think about how 1917 was such a strange and tumultuous time. And yet just over a hundred years later, um, a lot of those histories have concluded and, and yet some of them have such strange afterlives today and really continue today. Um, and um, yeah, I apologize. My thinking on this is is usually more coherent, but um, I just, um, yeah, I'm struck by our program and how it sits in a lot of really interesting other areas. You know, we're between like a conversation on NFTs and AIs and data capture and thinking about Duchamp's Fountain in that context is, you know, is a strange um, intervention, but I think it helps us think about what artists do um, in the world to, day and and you know historically how they've um intercepted history and and captured it in new ways and i'm just gonna pause now <laughs> before i go off too much thanks elliot um katya could i could yes uh Thank you. Um, yeah, I grew up in uh, South Germany in a small city called Würzburg. And um, as a kid, I, I was kind of confused because I discovered that um, the city looked quite uh, old, but then I discovered that it was completely destroyed after the Second World War and it was not really old. So there was a lot of reconstruction of the past and so also the space felt not homogen. There were a lot of new and old buildings uh, very close together. And uh, it, it was a question that I kind of did not um, folk, uh, that I did not feel anchored in my time. It was for me really confusing. And so I thought first, oh, I have to know lots of things about the past. And then maybe I can relate and then I can understand um, the space where I'm living in. So I started first with philosophy and but later on um, I dis discovered that that's not uh, the way. Um, so I started doing art and um, so the so through doing art, I think I found a kind of relation to my um, to, to my surrounding or to the field. Um, and um, concerning the the, sub the subject portray portraying future hope, um, the aspect of time in my work is is quite important. As I tried to open up, um, that um, I felt confused about the past and the present and the future. So it's about, for my work is a lot about bringing order in this kind of to understand and. Um, a very important aspect is um, the aspect that the past is not past <laughs> and that it's still active. And so this is an aspect um, I look at and that my work is very abstract. So I'm, I developed a kind of uh, language, an abstract language with two movements. It's about falling and folding. So the falling is kind of like that some, some, something falls into my into my present out of the past um, that's happened when you have a traumatic experience and um and the folding and um if things are folded and something is hidden or unseen um 
mute. Um, and so I, I work with these two dynamics. And um, so um, I think uh, that this aspect of kind of unfolding um, what is closed is, um, is uh, yeah, it's, it's also for me for this discussion here uh, uh, very important. And I'm, I'm in the moment, I'm in um, Israel. I, I've been yesterday uh, in Jerusalem and uh, I was at the Western Wall. So this is a place uh, for a lot of hope. And I uh, hope it's a very religious term. And um, so sure, I was thinking about about that, and that I think very, very different um, as an artist about future and hope. And um, yeah, maybe we would discuss it um, and get deeper a little bit. Thank you. Um, well, that's the that's the sort of formal proceedings gone on. Um, just just a thought there. I think um, Ellen, I think you've got it. Ah, thanks, Ellen. Um, now I don't. I hate muting people. I think it's kind of one of the great um, non-democratic actions that was invented in the past few years. But um, I do want us all to be talking. Um, just I'm just conscious that as we all talk simultaneously, there's all sorts of sort of feedback so please butt in um whenever you feel uh, like it um, i wondered if we could open this conversation because i think there's a few things that come up again and again when you have been speaking um and uh, i mean for example if we would go right back to where when annabelle was uh, speaking at the beginning and speaking of a shared language and um, and how her practice has been trying to explore ways of um, of, of bringing of, of of making things available through or, or discovering shared languages and so on. And I'm wondering whether to take her phrase um, whether that is a that art is a shared language that has an ability to transcend. And when I hear that very moving story of Ellen uh, talking about uh, being in the presence of people whose language she didn't understand um, and trying to find other ways um, to um, discern, to engage, to uh, participate. It seems to me that that, 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 when we speak of language, I don't necessarily speak of spoken language, but I think in terms of art as a language and what it might be able to do, is that how art can be prospective? That is to say, looking forward to the future. Is, is art do, able to do something in that way that other means of communication cannot? Um, I, would Hi. I just I suppose I was just gonna uh, wanted to kind of say I think it can and I think also I think art really helps us navigate being human uh, and kind of understanding uh, how it is to be human and kind of and I think there's uh, in that understand what we can become how how we will progress as a species I think art can really help or kind of really broader sense of that uh and i agree through kind of it's a language in itself and it's a language that transcends uh spoken any other language you know in a way because it's so visceral quite often um i mean you were talking you were talking lucy as of, of art as a way of thinking um in, in yeah when you, yeah um yeah and i kind of think yeah I think it's underestimated that, that, and I think artists are often uh, underestimated. As, as to be honest, if you kind of look at it as in this kind of situation where it's a kind of global conference of kind of politicians and businesses, I think artists are often really underestimated as a resource uh, in, in so much of their way of thinking and their perspective on possible futures and bring in their lang from the language to uh, help people understand what what the potential is for 
for for, for future. I think that, and, and, and I kind of feel that that is that, uh, and it's kind of underestimated, and it's not threaded through education enough. And it's kind of you can see where it's kind of. Oh, I don't think art as a as a subject is kind of put forward enough as being able to help um, find solutions. Yes. Yeah. Annabelle, you were going to say something. Um, sorry. I, I'm just taking the concept of language itself. Um, I wonder whether you couldn't say that the question is also who's translating the language, who's transcribing the language, you know, because I think that if we keep talking about, we talk about art as something as though we have some kind of idea of what it is or its shared quality, but um, it really is a question: who is it shared? Who is it shared by? Um, one of the one of the things in my practice when I, I basically crowdsource responses to quite, to the same question. For example, this piece: What do you forgive yourself for? Um, and what's really interesting is people do, people respond. You know, I'm, I always want to be one hundred percent sure that I'm actually giving as much as I'm taking. So. The question I, I wonder when I ask that is, are people just giving me stuff for my work? But what's funny is that they very often respond by saying, well, thank you so much for asking me, you know, and, and, and it made me think about that. And so what I'm, what I'm only, you know, I, I, I do think that there is something about art that we all share. We share it across history and we share it, you know, through, across cultures, but I'm also a little bit wary of, of thinking that it that it's that we're really using it to the extent that it can be that, that we're really sharing it to the extent that we can. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a, on on a, on, um, on something that Katya said um, in relation not to language but also but to time and um, we you know we've been talking about the future. Uh, and the possibilities and 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 Katie, you said something the past is not the past, and it is still active and I thought it was extraordinary convergence um between what you were saying and what Elliot was saying, bringing in Duchamp's perpetually present um ready made that that work that just a century later can't be resolved. I wonder if you two could think have any thought any more thoughts in terms of that because i think that you were both uh on the same page there yeah maybe i i made it a little bit too short <laughs> when, when as, how i said it what i mean is kind of when the when the past is kind of reactualizing itself and it's kind of stressing you and the present that means that it's kind of not integrated or that it's kind of not seen or not um, hold in a way and um, so I think uh, art is a lot of a lot of about creating space for um, also that's how I also see uh, what is my intention in my work is is exactly this subject of um, creating a space to, to to integrate something but so that something new can unfold and um, because if you future, if it's a projection of the past, then then the future is just a repetition, and that's why I think also the way how future can unfold is very important. How you kind of integrate the past, and um, and I think the aspect for me the aspect of space is here very important to create the space so that something can really. Uh, um, unfold in a new way, uh, not just as a as a projection. Yeah, I mean, space is yeah, space is a challenging word for me. I think it can mean so many different things, and you know, I think of like the spaces of museums, institutional spaces, and how they you know capture and structure histories of art or try to produce meaning amongst you know practices and histories and cultures that can be quite disparate so you know I want to think of art to have a, a little bit of universality to it or a, a quite a bit of it but I do wonder you know thinking about um, Annabelle was saying about you know who who gets to write this down or who transcribes it um, you know in the in the keeping of that history and the interpretation of it you know what what gets lost um, and, um, you know, 
how, how editorialized and and restructured are these um, you know these histories that we're telling ourselves? And I realize this is a panel about the future, not the past, but I can't help but keep going back to it. It's it's challenging. I think at least I am um, maybe stuck in in history a little bit. Um, can can we build from that? Can, is there a way of thinking or hypothesizing what an artwork might be a what, what kind of artwork might we be talking about in the future i mean is it is it impossible to i i, I think elliot's solution was to kind of look to the past and into it into a work that was strangely kind of retro presumably at the time and unbelievably futuristic uh, at the same time and and retains that status as a as a, as a kind of piece of kind of modern um strategic modernism if you like if, if you like but c- can we imagine what i mean I, i'm asking the impossible question in terms of what what, a, what an artwork might look like um is that about transcending genres is it about not working in conventional genres or is it about the opposite that actually the genre of painting the genre of object making be- precisely because it's so recognizable and it is its own language that is the way forward rather than necessarily kind of working in high the highest of high tech which in itself gets displaced by some kind of higher tech is there something about that that the mediums of art yes Ellen. okay um for me it comes back to what is constant which is the human spirit and the human heart i think we're all so terrified right now about the state of the world spinning out of control hatred everywhere i think that taking stock in what is a constant just an individual paying attention to other individuals talking with each other seeing each other for me our salvation goes back to the is dependent upon the simplest most basic interactions of respect which comes from learning which comes from education we fear each other because we don't know each other education is hugely important the com- combining of cultures um that's what i think it comes down to we mm-hmm. all love storytelling human beings love stories because we learn about each other through stories so let's learn each other's stories and maybe there's some hope for the future and um i mean that's that's that, that's um a kind of perfect um uh way for us to think move forward one of the terms that you used um earlier on was empathy and again lucy also used the same term and i found it interesting that that um what you've just been describing is probably a kind of um uh, a, a a version of that do you have any more could you expand on that and what empathy and art might be moving forward um i'm right now doing a portrait of a 73 year old 73 year young retired episcopalian minister of justice who is also african american she has worked with aids patients and their families to create havens for them where they can come together as a family for to heal to help heal the person who's ill um she has worked in the episcopalian church to make it possible for the community to know that every single person in that community is welcome in their um I don't remember what what she calls the group the the um church members 
just hearing her stories and understanding, learning, she has worked to welcome people fills me with incredible joy, which I then bring into to other people in my life. I can't wait for her to come tomorrow to sit with me. Um, I think just spending time with people, finding ways to spend time with people, to get to know them is powerful. And then I portray her. I find a way to make a painting about her that conveys her, the memories that she carries. Speaking of the past again, she tells me of her growing up. I find a way in my portrait to include a symbol of remembrance. She stimulates me to look for ways to portray her and her past so that people who see the painting after it's done might come away with an, a, an, an interest in her. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'm just conscious that we've got three minutes left. Um, Bertrand has been waiting to ask a question for a few minutes, uh, and I might hand okay. over the microphone to them if they're still there. Bertrand, are you there? you hear me now? Hi. Me now? Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm Bertrand. Um, when I was asked to take part in the Ceresis thing, I applied uh, really for this. Uh, panel as well as to the other I took part in finally um, and uh, this theme of hope is for me really essential because um, we have to I think art has very very many possibilities to give hints to um, to inspire people to, for anything good and this might be in the piece itself or by the artist talk it's just that we need the emphasis to uh, to to reach out to people and encourage them to take part in these discuss discussions and to see well there's so much important things to do in the world just take part do anything there is so much to do we just need your help and uh, never stop just, just the, the moment the bomb comes until then you can do good things and this is what yeah, about about empathy. Um, beauty can save the world. This is the the this Dostoevsky spruch. It's really, if you have the the sensibility for the beauty of any creature, and you appreciate it and you show it, this you don't need words or any kind of things for it. I think this is our option, and so I go for this option. Well, that's one. Thank you very much. Um, I think you might end up being um, having the last word because in, implausibly we run out of time. Um, we get forty-five minutes to to to, as you say, save the world. Your proposal that beauty <laughs> can save the world. Um, I think you know. I think I'll go with that. Um, and um, it really you know, at the risk of cutting everybody off in their prime, um, please make a deal with me today um, as we're recording this, um, that we can continue our conversations somehow, somewhere else. Um, it's been really a pleasure. Um, and it remains for me uh, to thank in particular, Annabelle, Ellen, Lucy, Elliot and Katya for uh, contributing today. I think you'll understand and, and, and agree with me that, that really very, very different ways of thinking about what art can be and what it can do. Uh, and I think um, reassuring um, us that art will does have a role to play and can establish hope for a future. So really, thank you all for, your, uh, for, for being here um, and for starting a conversation. Uh, I hope more will follow. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi, thank you. Bye. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay.
So, wie komme ich jetzt wieder raus hier? Danke.